Good morning. I welcome you all uh, to this uh, instruction course on traumatic cat attack. Uh, there are no specific studies as far as the traumatic cat attack is concerned. Uh, though study, uh, some studies they put it as 23 to 50% among serious eye injuries. There are various causes for this, but of these, the common causes are this blunt injury and penetrating ocular trauma in most of the cases. But the, the host of, I have not mentioned all the names here. In a country like ours, uh, uh, there are umpteen number of uh, reasons as to why the eye can get injured, as you see here. Uh, the bone error, pencils, pain, the torn injuries. S clinical evaluation is uh, very, very important. A thorough clinical examination will tell us a lot of things and then there are investigations to be done. Uh, as you see here, it, it may be a partial, present as a partial cataract, uh, which uh, permits the fundus examination, then another ocular examination. Uh, in case if it is clinically significant, then we'll have to consider. There can be a total cataract like this following blunt injury. Uh, so this, we don't know why about the post segment. Uh, so this is one thing. Otherwise, the anti-capsule may be torn with the posterior sinica like this, and uh, there can be a corneal scar uh, com <coughs> complicating the matter further. There may be an associated posterior capsular rent here. So this also has to be kept in mind, and this particular thing will uh, help us to change the surgical strategy. The usually, traumatic cataract is associated with uh, a lot of other things like a corneal tear, or there can be a glaucoma associated with the traumatic cataract, or there may be damage to the iris, iridodialysis, or there can be posterior segment complications in the form of uh, vitreous hemorrhage, retinal tear, retinal dialysis, or in case if pupil is not affected, then if you find there is an RJPD, probably optic nerve may also be damaged. There can be vitreous in the antechamber, which uh, suggests uh, two things. Either there is a through and through uh, tear, a through and through uh, entry in the anterior and posterior capsule, or there may be zonular diuresis, as we see here. So this, again, the surgical strategy should change uh, according to the requirements. So we have B-scan ultrasonography, which helps us in detecting uh, most of the things. We can identify even the posterior capsular end. They, we may identify vitreous hemorrhage or there may be retinal attachment or there can be a foreign body sometimes. Uh, CT scan, which is done as a part of uh, head injury evaluation. So there you'll find, uh, the, I mean, this can also contribute to the ocular uh, diagnosis as well as the orbital injuries, if at all there is uh, something. So there are a lot of uh, dilemmas that we come across uh, today. One is the primary versus the secondary cataract removal, whether it should be done at the time of uh, the initial repair or it should be conducted. Uh, and uh, there can be either eyewell has to be implanted at the primary stage itself, if at all, and then what is the eyewell power calculation? taking into consideration the corneal injuries and other things, or it should be deferred for a secondary lens implantation. So to answer all these questions, we have this particular course, uh, a video con con course on comprehensive management of traumatic cataract and associated ocular condis conditions. For this, we have eminent faculty, uh, myself, Dr. Satyamurthy, then uh, Dr. Bharti Megur, she is there to come. She will be speaking on uh, the posterior capsular descents, especially the occult PC rent, and then what are the eyewall, how to manage traumatic attack with it, and then eyewall options in cases with poor capsular support. Dr. Bharti Megur is a VR surgeon uh, from uh, Megur IK Center in Bida, Karnataka. And then uh, we have, of course, a local hero, Dr. Uh, Shreesh Kumar. He'll be dealing with uh, the carnal tear our current population with the traumatic cataract and then how to go about managing uh, this particular thing. And then I'll be talking to you about subluxated traumatic cataract, how to manage, and uh, then uh, glaucoma associated with traumatic cataract. We have Dr. Deepak Megur, a prolific uh, FECO surgeon and uh, uh, renowned uh, glaucoma specialist of Karnataka. Uh, he is from uh, Megur IK Center, Bidar, and then 
uh, the anterior segment reconstruction especially the iris damage the aerodialysis and the iris tears will be dealt with by dr K uh, krishna prasad kurlu who is uh, the director of uh, prasad netraya group of hospitals in Kana in uh, south kendra the coastal karnataka uh, he is uh, the aos uh, scientific committee member at the at present and then secretary of karnataka ophthalmic society and then we have uh, dr meena chakravarti a well-known uh, we are surgeon of our country she'll be talking to you as about uh, the management of uterinal problems associated with the uh, traumatic cataract so with these i request uh, dr shish kumar to uh, deliver the talk thank you to all of you uh, and uh, I welcome you all to Coimbatore. Uh, so the my topic is uh, corneal chair for co uh, cooperation with the traumatic cataract management. Uh, at the outset I would like to thank Dr. Satyamurti for uh, giving me this opportunity. So uh, like uh, whenever a patient comes with injury uh, uh, we have to assess the nature and extent of injury and uh, uh, we have to determine what exactly is injured, how deep does the injury go, or what are the structures which are involved uh, due to injury, and uh, plan your uh, surgical procedure accordingly. So uh, I am not going into the details of this, uh, so uh, like it's going to be covered uh, in the subsequent talks. Uh, just going to uh, tell you some uh, practical tips uh, on how to manage uh, corneal uh, chairs and uh, uh, traumatic cataract, uh, associated traumatic cataract. Uh, so coming to principles of uh, surgical repair of corneal uh, lacerations, uh, uh, we have to identify certain anatomical landmarks. Uh, you have this limbus and uh, some pigmented lines on the cornea or uh, laceration angles or some uh, uh, superficial corneal scars. So you have to try to oppose these uh, uh, landmarks. This helps in the good opposition of the wound and uh, thus it prevents wound slippage or uh, overriding of the wounds. Uh, so when we are dealing with the vertical laceration like this, uh, what exactly we have to do to prevent overriding is uh, the distance between the point of entry and uh, the anterior wound lip should be equal to the distance between the wound lip and uh, the exit point. So this A should be equal to B. So this actually gives a correct opposition of the wound margin. However, this doesn't apply for shallowed incisions like this. This is a shallowed incision and uh, you can see it's an angled incision. Uh, uh, if you follow the same principle, it will cause uh, overriding of the uh, wound margins. Uh, so what we have to do is, uh, uh, we have to consider the posterior distance, that is the point of entry to the posterior lip should be equal to point of entry, a uh, point of exit and uh, the posterior lip. So this distance should be equal to this distance. This prevents overriding of the wound. And uh, at any point, uh, there should be it should be perpendicular uh, to the wound. Otherwise, any angled uh, incision, uh, angle suturing will cause uh, overriding. And when we are dealing with a large wound like this, passing through the center, so we have to place uh, uh, sutures in the periphery first, and uh, 
and these uh, sutures should be long and uh, should have compressive sutures and should be placed uh, uh, close to each other and we are going to uh, flatten the periphery and this will cause increased curvature in the center and as you move towards the center uh, the uh, size of the bias should be small and it should be more spaced uh, and it's not it should not be uh, compressive uh, sutures so and you can even avoid the central pupillary area if it is possible and uh, a case like this uh, when we are dealing with the corneoscleral tear so first oppose at the limbus and then you do all your corneal suturing and then come back to scleral suturing so coming to uh, some case scenarios uh, this particular patient uh, uh, is a case of uh, combined uh, cataract and uh, what is it yeah it was moving yes yeah yes 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 panel ke yeah scroll panel ke yeah scroll idhar panel ke okay yeah so here uh, the there is anterior capsular tear and there is a intumescent cataract uh, however uh, uh, the uh, cortical matter is uh, uh, not in the anterior chamber we can go ahead and uh, do only a corneal tear repair and we can subsequently at a later date uh, go ahead and uh, do a uh, uh, traumatic cataract cataract uh, surgery this is another case uh, uh, where another case where uh, uh, we have done a corneal tear repair initially and uh, uh, <coughs> there is a uh, traumatic cataract as well uh, and uh, there is a large cor cornea uh, uh, capsular tear to try to convert it into a uh, uh, capsular axis wherever it is possible and uh, should be very careful and uh, uh, don't let the ac collapse tear and uh, it can give way and uh, it can uh, lead to a, a wrap around defect uh, wrap around the corneal tear uh, um, capsular tear which can extend to the posterior capsule the next uh, case uh, there are these are two similar cases uh, that uh, there is a corneal tear which has been repaired in both the uh, cases uh, one is a left eye and the other one is uh, right eye both are almost similar cases uh, however uh, in the left eye the wound the corneal tear is superior and uh, in the right eye it is inferior and uh, in both the cases there is a cornea anterior cor below the corneal tear you have uh, uh, posterior capsular tear also here uh, and uh, since in the left eye uh, the tear is superior we can always go ahead and uh, uh, place a, a three piece lens or whatever the lens you have uh, opted for but in the uh, other case that is in the right eye where there is uh, no support inferiorly uh, you may have to go ahead and uh, implant a iris flip ioi so oh, even though the place looks uh, similar but uh, the location of the corneal tear is different uh, one is uh, superior and the other one is inferior and uh, the capsular tear uh, which is uh, extending uh, to the posterior capsule uh, uh, the lens may not be stable in the second case that is in the right eye so i have placed a iris clip i oil here the case of uh, corneal injury there is iris prolapse uh, here uh, the uh, old uh, uh, thought is uh, that whenever there is an iris uh, uh <coughs> iris uh, prolapse uh, should be operated within 6 uh, hours of uh, the injury and uh, otherwise uh, the iris has to be excised this concept is gone if uh, this is a case uh, 
if you see there it's not there there no form so uh, like uh, there is a thin uh, layer of epithelium covering the uh, iris prolapsed iris you just have to remove it uh, and if the iris is not so badly damaged we can always uh, preserve this iris uh, and we just uh, <coughs> reposition the iris because uh, the presence of this iris it acts like a diaphragm and definitely the patient will have good quality of vision uh, once uh, the wound heals so instead of sacrificing the iris and the patient will have a significant glaze so you just have to uh, oppose uh, the wound and suture it uh, Another case of uh, corneal laceration. This uh, looks very bad, actually. This particular patient uh, uh, had multiple levels of uh, tear uh, in the cornea, and uh, this uh, there are uh, two levels uh, at which the cornea is torn. And uh, even though it looks bad, once uh, it heals, uh, definitely there will be significant improvement. And uh, at this stage, you can't even do a penetrating keratoplasty. It may not be practical. Uh, so you just have to oppose the wound and uh, suture it. Uh, even the tabs here, it looks uh, as if it is going to uh, uh, tear away, but uh, you just have to include it in the wound and suture it. Uh, it may be useful. Uh, and uh, the follow-up, if you see, this particular patient has improved significantly. This is uh, uh, first week, and uh, this is six weeks, and this is six months post-op uh, follow-up. And this patient is doing very well. Uh, uh, with the iris clip eye oil, the patient had a traumatic uh, uh, cataract also. And uh, the last uh, video, this is actually a blast injury. This particular patient had multiple corneal scars because of the blast injury. And uh, he had undergone uh, lensectomy, vitrectomy. And as a secondary uh, procedure for uh, visual rehabilitation, uh, uh, visual rehabilitation, uh, so I'm just implanting uh, iris clip eye oil here. Uh, uh, it looks bad, but uh, the patient has uh, improved significantly uh, uh, with the iris clip eye oil. Uh, and uh, he may need a penetrating keratoplasty if the visual acuity is uh, uh, not improving. Uh, but this particular patient had improved to 618. So the patient is happy with the outcome. Uh, and we can always wait. Any inflamed eye, the uh, chances of uh, graft survival is uh, limited. Uh, in such cases, if at all it is absolutely needed, we should go ahead and do a penetrating keratoplasty. Otherwise, uh, definitely we can uh, uh, wait and watch. This is the post-operative picture mark. of, yeah, it's almost yeah. over, yeah. And uh, so to conclude, uh, it is a difficult uh, uh, management situation uh, uh, having a, a corneal tear and a traumatic cataract. Uh, one should be methodical and systematic in approaching these cases. Uh, each case is different and uh, you should have an individual case-based approach to achieve uh, success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shreefumar. Now, uh, I'll be talking to you about the subluxated cataract that will be followed in the other speakers will follow. There's a slight change in the order because the speakers are coming now. Uh, subluxated cat traumatic attack is a definitely a challenge which we'll have to keep in mind. The, the various, the way exact ways of uh, exact surgical strategies that we should uh, adopt. Now here, if you see the vitreous uh, anterior vitrectomy is going on. And then after uh, staining the capsule, capsular axis has been done. Now using uh, the direct ch vertical chop, I am uh, emulsifying the fragments. Surgery was going on very well. You see the two capsular hooks that were placed to support the capsular bag. And uh, throughout I was injecting uh, viscoelastic substance to see that the posterior capsule won't come into the phaco tip. So surgery was going on very well. It was a soft cataract and a relatively young patient. So at one point of time, the vitreous came to the phaco tip. So I had to stop. 
So this means there was a, a pre-existing vent which we could not identify. Then an anti dry anterior vitrectomy was done. Uh, here one should not do bi bimanual anterior vitrectomy because there is a possibility of these fragments to go down into the vitreous. Then they remain under the cover of uh, the dispersive viscoelastic. Like viscoat, I have no financial interest. You can emulsify other fragments, keeping the parameters low. And then every time you inject viscoelastic substance to before you withdraw the phaco tip and then using a single cannula the remaining uh, soft uh, cortical matter was aspirated. So now here here the zonules were weak and then there is a rent you can make out. Uh, so this bank had to be fixed to the sclera so you can't obviously put a CON ring or a CTR. So I am using a capsular tension segment of our mud and then switch it to the sclera there. And now this area is uh, secured. So uh, we, uh, we can place a three piece hydrophobic eyewall in the sulcus. Since this area is uh, totally covered, the zonal adhesions will not allow the, I mean the, uh, will not allow the haptic to migrate in that area. So you can comfortably place lens in the sulcus and uh, capture the optic in the back because the axis is still intact. So the take home message here is, uh, even if uh, uh, there is a rent, the zonal in the presence of zonal dialysis, one can still fix the bag to the sclera with the help of uh, CTS segments. And then of course you will have to follow all the principles of uh, doing uh, proper uh, vitrectomy. This is another case where if you see there is a zonal dialysis and you can see it is extending from here to here. So anti-capsule was stained with the trypan blue. One uh, problem here is uh, the drain and uh, the blue dye may trickle into the vitreous and thereby the fundal glow becomes difficult. Now using uh, visco cannula as a sort of visco pump trying to complete the axis with the help of uh, axis forceps. The capsular axis in a, any subluxated cataract has to be at least uh, 4 5 millimeter in diameter so that there should be 1 millimeter of the capsule of fornix where you can place the thing and then if it is too small then place uh, it will be very difficult to use the capsular hooks. So now hydro dissection is very important you have to mobilize the nucleus properly and then once it is done here the endocapsular tension ring is going into the bag. This is uh, in, in, uh, in may not be a correct idea because this is not going to stabilize the lens, stabilize the capsular bag. It only it, it can center the bag in this proper place. Now, so the bag has to be supported with the help of either iris hooks or the capsular hooks. Capsular hooks are better because that it has got a bend and then it uh, pulls the bag towards the equator, the lens equator. Then surgical principles depend de depending upon the density of the cataract. So here it was very soft. So I could uh, aspirate the cortex and uh, remove these iris hooks and then place lens in the bag. So this way the surgery can be completed. Only thing is uh, we'll have to keep all these thing, uh, all the steps in mind and then uh, so the incision should be uh, away from, they try to be away from the uh, zonal area of zonal adhesions and then bag place, uh, uh, eye oil can be placed in the bag or can be fixed to the sclera or you can place an AC eye oil, results are good. So proper evaluation, proper surgical strategy, ability to implant eye oil in the absence of uh, capsular support should give you good results. Thank you very much for your patient visit. Hello sir, uh, thank you for the uh, presentation and then few questions before the next speaker asks. What would be your uh, uh, timing of CTR insertion? Do you f have any guidelines? Do you suggest any guidelines? No, ideally, CTR when should we use the CTR? CTR uh, should be the last uh, thing to go since it uh, takes support from the remaining zonules. It will not uh, stabilize the bag, as I said. In case if zonular adhesions increases during surgery, then uh, the entire uh, 
bag with the CTR will go into the uterus cavity. So that is one uh, fear. So to stabilize, you have other things like uh, capsular hooks. Uh, CTR, only CTR to be used if it is less than three clock hours, if the dialysis is less than three clock hours at the end of surgery. If anything more than that, then depending upon the stability of the bag, so you can decide whether to go with the CTR or with the CNA ring or okay. with the capsular tension segment as I showed yes, sir. yes sir. Thank you. Now I request Dr. Uh, Bharti Megu to speak on uh, traumatic attack with the uh, PC dehiscence and the naval options in uh, patients with poor capsular support. Dr. Bharti, please. Good morning everybody, I am Dr. Bharti Megu. I would like to thank Satyamurthy sir for having given this opportunity for me. Uh, I just want to see whether this mouse works. Come over here. Talking about IOL options in the presence of PC dehiscence in traumatic cataract, the key steps in the management, management of traumatic cataract begin with pre-op assessment, decision making regarding the procedure, whether to implant a lens or not. In the pre-op assessment, we have very important steps that is history, slit lamp examination and uh, the most important investigative tool in ocular trauma that is the B scan. His, uh, history taking and slit lamp examination are very crucial because they give us some fair idea about the severity of the injury and also whether it was a penetrating injury or was it a blunt injury or what we call closed globe injury. These are the slit lamp uh, pictures of some of the different types of cataracts at presentation because of trauma. One common thing amongst all these uh, traumatic cataracts is the presence of PC dehiscence. We have immature cataracts, total subluxation, and sometimes these white intumescent cataracts which present within hours to days after injury. So the most important investigative tool in management of ocular trauma is B-scan. As we see, there is an intumescent white cataract. The slit lamp examination does not reveal much details regarding what is the post-capsular post status. So there is a suspicion of PC dehiscence lens matter within the anterior vitreous, which is obvious in the B-scan. Apart from this, to rule out retino retinal and vitreous comorbidities, Ocular B scan is the most important and conclusive tool. Procedures depend upon the merits of the case. So it could be seco emulsification, small incision, or ECCE. But the principle would be to maintain a closed chamber and not to allow the enlargement of the PC tear so that the nucleus does not eventually go down. So whether to implant an IL or not depends upon few considerations here. Secondary implantation can be or should be done or a deferred implantation should be done when we have poor visibility, vitreoretinal comorbidities or a very huge risk of infection. So when I have decided to do a primary implantation, my simple game plan or strategy would be like this. If I have a small PC tear, if they in the back placement of the lens is possible, I would do. Whenever there is an intact rectus and a large PC tear, a sulcus placement is possible. 
absolutely no capsular support, then I would go ahead and put an iris claw lens or a spheral fixated lens. So let me show some of the surgical videos. This is a patient who presented with a traumatic cataract, a penetrating injury, six months old. We see in the slit lamp anterior capsule fibrotic scar. There is a PC tear with a penetrating tract, which is obvious in the slit lamp examination. There was no retained intraocular foreign body. My intraop considerations in this patient was would this PC tear eventually increase, the nucleus would go down, or will I be able to put an implant, IL implant? So I begin my surgery. I've decided to do phaco emulsification. I use a soft shell technique here. I initiate the rexis. It runs into the fibrotic scar. Here it is at the risk of running radial. This is when I do, uh, decide to go ahead and do complete the rexis with a micro vitrectomy, forceps and scissors. After snipping with the scissors, I complete the rexis with the forceps. After initial removal of the epinucleus, I do the in situ hydro delineation. The lateral separation is done and using very low parameters, I complete the removal of the nucleus hemi. A part of the hemi nucleus and the epinucleus and cortex is visco separated and I complete the cortical wash. Now the PC tear starts to become obvious. I realize that there is a small radial extension in the anterior capsular rexis as well. I need to be uh, cautious in that uh, the vitreous is not disturbed, so I check with triamcinone acetate. So I implant a lens within the bag, and here the most important aspect of this surgery is we were lucky enough to place the lens within the bag, and I confirmed that the vitreous is not disturbed. So the anterior highlight was intact. The radial tear was there in the anterior capsule, so I oriented the haptics to 90 degrees against the radial tear. So luckily this patient's surgery went off well and the anterior hyaloid was not disturbed despite the PC tear. This is the three days post-op picture. This is another case of intumescent cataract due to penetrating injury. What we saw earlier in the B scan was the disturbance of the post capsule with the lens matter being seen in the anterior vitreous phase. And uh, as we saw in the slit lamp, the anterior capsule was flat. This is another important sign to indicate that there is a PC tear. So here I am doing a synecolysis. Once the pupil dilates well after the synecolysis, my care is to not to involve the rexis in the fibrotic scar because it has a huge risk of running radial. I avoid that, get a small rexis done, do a den gentle hydro dissection and remove the swollen lens matter, get the cleavage between the capsule and the lens matter. Using very low parameters, I remove the soft cortex. This is a 35 year old man, so there is obviously no nucleus here. The followability of the cortex to the phaco tip is not so good. This is when I realize that there must be some vitreous present in the bag. So I go and do a visco tamponading of the vitreous. So it is very crucial that we tamponate the vitreous so that it uh, does not further travel towards the phaco handpiece. To have a mu much more controlled removal of the cortex, I use the bimanual irrigation aspiration cannula and remove all the cortex. Almost uh, 70 to 80 percent of the cortex is removed, then I realized that the PC tear is obvious now. And I have a suspicion that the vitreous is also present. So I use triamcinone acetate, 1 is to 2 dilution, to check whether the vitreous is also present. So obviously some amount of vitreous is there within the bag. I do a limited anterior vitrectomy now. As you can see, there is a fibrotic area in the uh, posterior capsule as well. 
and some amount of vitreous is present. Once I remove the vitreous, I recheck whether the vitreous is totally removed from within the bag. And this is again the second step of uh, injecting triamcinone and rechecking this. Once I am sure that the vitreous has been cleared from within the bag, I go ahead and implant a three-piece lens in the sulcus. This is a three-piece hydrophobic lens. The haptics are in the sulcus and I aim to get an optic capture and I observe for the ovalization of the anterior rectus margin. Here again, what was important that uh, there was a big PC tear and despite that we could easily implant a lens within the sulcus because of the integrity of the anterior capsular rectus. This is the third case. Where there is subluxation, Dr. K. V. Satyamurti sir showed some of the subluxated cataracts. This is the third case and here we are showing some uh, grossly subluxated traumatic cataracts due to a closed globe injury. My aim here is to remove this nucleus through a scleral tunnel incision. I fashion a six and a half to seven millimeter size scleral tunnel. Two side ports are made along the horizontal meridian 180 degrees apart and using the sandwich technique I remove the nucleus out. I tamponate the vitreous again using a dispersive OVD, push the posterior capsule and the vitreous behind and remove the lens. Here my plan is to implant the iris claw lens. lens is inserted inside and using the dalji lens holding forceps, I tuck the iris tissue between the slits in the haptic and get the enclavation done. Similarly, the second haptic is also enclaved. So, anterior iridectomy is done using the vitreous cutters, looking out for the stability of the lens by tapping on the lens. And here with the total absence of the bag, this is a good option of putting an iris claw lens. This is a fifth uh, case where I am showing as a deferred IOL implantation, a scleral fixated sutured lens. To summarize, So, in the presence of a small PC tear when the rectus is intact, in the black placement of the lens is possible. When the large PC tear in presence of a very good rectus, sulcus placement is possible. So, when there is absolutely no capsular support, iris claw lens or scleral fixated lens are a good option. As such, deferred IOL implantation or secondary implantation can also be done when the condition is conducive for secondary implant. Thank you for the patient hearing. questions uh, so uh, now uh, let us move on to the next topic uh, traumatic cataracts uh, with glaucoma uh, dr deepak mehru Respected Chair, good morning uh, friends, I'll be speaking on uh, the uh, coexisting pathologies of traumatic cataract and secondary glaucoma which is uh, co not uncommon uh, because uh, there are many mechanisms by which glaucoma can be seen in eyes with trauma. So in penetrating injury it could be because of the ruptured anterior lens capsule and uveitis, is all leading to secondary glaucoma and sec in the uh, blunt trauma wherein the lens subluxation is causing pupillary block or there could be angle recession. There's multiple mechanisms by which glaucoma can happen in the case of trauma. So let's begin by a few of the cases. Now this is a, a 42 year old gentleman who has sustained trauma and the interesting aspect about this uh, thing was that uh, he, this sus trauma was sustained three months back and uh, with the wood and the presentation was he was having a pressure of about almost 52 uh, millimeters of mercury 
and uh, there is an inferiorly the cornea and the uh, the iris are all sticking together i was worried about corneal decompensation because it's almost 3 months old and this is the area which is sealed actually now the pressure is very high and the the concerns which we are here he is does this patient have a pre existing posterior capsular tear and uh, how do we manage this area whether the ac is going to form or the cyanide can be released so uh, we begin by just trying to create some form of capsulotomy using rexis um, forceps and scissors uh, we don't know what is the extent of this capsular tear which has gone beyond this area so because this is sticking on to the uh, uh, cornea still there because the lens matter is very soft we can just gently irrigate and maneuver it just out into the anterior chamber and then aspirate uh when you are using a bimanual ia care has to be taken that the infusion pressure is not too high because we don't know exactly what is the status of the posterior capsule here so uh, you need to be aware that you could be dealing with a an open posterior capsule so luckily in this patient there is no posterior capsule uh, uh, issue here again gentle manipulation we release the iris cyanide from the cornea and then we could manage to place the intraocular lens into the bag here and the primary reason for glaucoma was a swollen lens matter and the antisynecae and surprisingly this patient did well in spite of having uh, uh, the aridocorneal touch for almost 3 year 3 months and there is no uh, endothelial decompensation seen later on so the results are quite gratifying in major situations the timely intervention is probably the most important message which i'd like to uh, give to you second case again similar case a penetrating injury uh, um, and you have a lens matter the lens matter is all has come out here the lens becomes swollen you can see the anterior chamber is shallow and the patient would have severe pressure in these are situations where if, uh, emergency intervention is mandatory just immediately after controlling inflammation and glaucoma you need to intervene and get this lens out because it's going to cause raised iop uveitis and all sorts of things so this is one situation where you know early intervention is very critical the procedure as such is very simple because the lens matter is soft again a young patient two paracentesis and uh, using a bimanual ia just to aspirate out all the small uh, soft cort cortex here again you need to be wary of the fact that uh, we are should expect a pre existing pc tear in most of these traumatic ca patients we don't know how it's going to be there so be wary of that and be the critical the most take home message here would be one important thing is never lose the chamber the secret of the surgery is always try to maintain the chamber and also not over inflate the chamber too deep an ac or too shallow an ac has to be avoided and once you cleared the lens matter then your job is to assess what is the extent of pc whether it is a pc tear is there or not and with a little bit of a patience and care most of these cases can be managed very well there is uh, the surgery is not so difficult at all again you make an capsulotomy opening of an adequate size usually we do it after all the lens matter is removed because the visibility is very clear now and then again we could manage to place the implant into the bag here the case could look very bad when uh, at this little lamp and all but eventually the results and outcomes are far, are quite good and very gratifying and this is the the coronal wound uh, the small scar which will re remain there and uh, eventually you have a very good you have to expect post operative reaction like this is in fibrin there but uh, they usually clear off this is how the case was looking after 2 weeks Uh, in spite of a radial tear the lens is well centered the haptics have to be oriented away from the uh, radial tear of the capsule now moving on to the next case this is a case of a 65 year old man blunt trauma who has got uh, anterior subluxation of the cataract which is causing pushing the iris lens there from forward and causing secondary glaucoma uh, this is a situation where again you know surgical intervention is the only uh, therapy permanent therapy here you can't control the pressures by medications for long this is the area of zunilla dyson's about 4 to 5 o'clock hours the most important thing would be like you know first put in dispersive ovd to tamponate this area and i'm after that i'm trying to stain it because the stain doesn't get into the vitreous cavity by following this technique because once the uh, the stain gets into the vitreous cavity the visibility is hampered because it appears blue the rexus is probably the most important step in all these cataracts because in these subluxated cataracts and uh, Uh, you have to ensure that these are the situations where forceps becomes mandatory you can't use a needle here so once you have a rexus then there is all ways by which you can stabilize the bag by hooks rings and segments 
So the most, I think the critical step in the entire surgical process is going to be just getting your axis right. So uh, I'm not so happy with the size of axis. I'm just trying to uh, uh, enlarge it. Both the size and centration are critical because I have to decenter it, uh, looking into account the, the temporal uh, subluxation of the lens. Before putting in the ring or anything, I want to just ensure, uh, do a gentle hydrodissection. Uh, and then I need to decide whether I want to inject uh, the CTR now itself or should I do it later. In this situation, uh, I decide to implant the ring at this stage. Again, a key point would be create some space under the anterior capsule by using uh, sodium hyaluronate and then it's easier for her to thread in the ring and also the cortex entrapment under the ring uh, can be minimized. So once you've done this, then you've stabilized mm -hmm. the uh, stabilize the bag and before doing that again check for the presence of vitreous uh, because uh, it, it could have just sneaked through the area of the defect. You stabilize the bag by using uh, the hooks and then uh, you are uh, completing the procedure here. Again you have to stabilize the, uh, you are placing the lens and this strategy here is to just place the lens in the sulcus and uh, do an optic capture. There was a transolular uh, migration of the vitreous again in this case I needed to do a uh, a pass plan a vitrectomy just to take care of this and the sclerotomy uh, closed here. So this is how the patient was uh, looking uh, one day post-op. So this, the coming to the other aspect, the angle recession glaucomas are extremely difficult to manage. You know, they are very, very refractory to treatment. And here, a combi this is the angle recession. The widened ciliary body band which you are seeing is the, uh, the angle recession which you are seeing. This is a young patient, say about 40 year old patient and these uh, glaucomas are extremely refractive uh, to treatment. They, you have to have a surgical intervention. The first setting would be try a trabeculectomy, mitomycin C. I just uh, injected mitomycin in the, mitomycin C in the subtenant space and uh, I'm doing a two site uh, uh, procedure here. This is the trabeculectomy flap which have created spheral flap, complete the uh, intraocular lens implantation, shift superiorly, and then I'm performing the uh, trabeculectomy here. So compared to the other case scenarios where the intraocular pressure controlling is just by taking out the cataract is possible, in angle recession glaucoma, you need to combine with an anti-glaucoma, fi uh, the filtration surgery, or most often than not, they eventually require uh, tubes. So with these uh, few uh, cases, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deepak. It was a wonderful uh, video presentation. Uh, and uh, <coughs> the first uh, case uh, which uh, you have shown, like you uh, injected a uh, hydrophilic IO, is it uh, purposely or uh, is it what the patient? Uh, uh, frozen on the, uh, the affordability in the package. Any question? Uh, now let us move on to the next uh, topic. Uh, Anti-segment reconstruction in cases of uh, traumatic attract uh, uh, by Dr. Krishna Prasad Kudlu. Thank you, Dr. Shisha. In fact, I thank Dr. Satyamurthy to include in a uh, wonderful instruction course. Arjun. This is my fin no my financial interest. So, so uh, now most of the injuries has been I think corneal tear has been tackled by Dr. Satyamurthy. Uh, so I'll be talking mainly about the iris injuries because it's very important. Someone has got iris injury. Uh, the war 
overall uh, it can give rise to the uh, the patient will have a uh, glare and even a photophobia also and sometimes this iris base along with the ciliary body can damage especially as far as the contusion injury is also concerned so as you know that it's a aperture and the mechanical barrier between the entry chamber and the posterior chamber so what are the five major consequence can happen in uh, iris injuries mainly traumatic midriasis iris laceration can happen iris prolapse can happen aortic dialysis and aniridia so how straight away will come to the management of uh, uh, traumatic midriasis it might be either might be immediate or late complication of iris laceration when we have to actually tackle this uh, traumatic midriasis whenever patient has got uh, glare and visual deterioration so straight away there are the few different techniques described by the different surgeon so you need to assess how much is going to be the um, uh, traumatic midriasis depending upon that you can offer uh, uh, the different technique if the midriasis is little bit small then you can go for a something called a single suture technique where exactly you pass a 90 prolin suture pass through the limbus and through the iris in line and propose the suture track and a bond hook is introduced to the paracentesis and two suture ends are drawn out through the wound and uh, you can put a sort of a triple knot uh, throw knot so that uh, you can um, uh, the you can uh, when you suture it then you can cut externally and which is close to the knot so i'll just show you the see here the case actually you can see both uh, there is a traumatic midriasis is also there and uh, even uh, aortic dialysis also there so after doing the good capsular axis then you pass the iris repositor uh, through the paracentesis you try to release all the synechia then once you release the synechia then the iris is little bit free from its uh, uh, attachment then you can put the uh, iris retractor just to pull the iris towards the wherever it has got aerodialysis since you uh, can see because the traumatic at normally that there will not be any hard nucleus so with the help of uh, bimanual irrigation only you can take out the left over cortex so when you're taking out left over cortex so make sure that all the parameters should be as less as possible and uh, once you i think notice as dr deepak showed in his previous case if you see that there is a there is a subluxation then try to put a, a ctr so make sure that when you're putting the ctr also most of us we try to put it fast but uh, you put it within the bag after putting the bag i think bag has been stabilized then you can implant the intraocular lens so all these steps especially whenever there is injury or insult to the eye always whenever you are manipulating also you have to be uh, little like uh, slow in your manipulation so that uh, chances of damaging further damaging you can prevent once you put the intraocular lens then i think whatever the leftover cortex also you can remove then um, so one paracentesis is already done just adjacent to the in the sclera adjacent to the wherever there is aortic dialysis then straight to the suture along with the this thing you can pass through the iris through and through then just you take out the suture then you can turn the needle then once again you can go through that wound only then through the iris then take out so once you're taking out also you should be really careful so you do not have to hurry the procedure once you take out a single suture i think you can see almost uh, round people there so sometimes if the um, uh, midriasis is large then i think you may have to put a sort of a running suture technique where you can uh, oh, one limbal paracentesis place in each quadrant the entry chamber is uh, entered with a sort of a spatula type curved uh, trans chamber needle with the help of a something called ten zero polypropylene uh, suture so the now the needle is passed through the iris margin waving suture through so after waving through this iris margin then three to four times you have to go through the this iris keep suturing so your overall aim should be you should get the round pupil as much as possible so once you exit through the through the last paracentesis the knot is tied together and brought into the eye with a hook and tightened so while uh, tightening also you should make sure that we should not pull that much so exactly i don't have that much uh, the, regarding this case this has been done in my hospital only so you can see some sort of a traumatic metastasis so already see we have put a um, posterior iris clip lens still after putting the iris clip lens still our job to at least get this iris into a proper shape 
So needle has been passed through and it has been taken out. When you are passing also make sure that uh, you are not uh, disturbing the lens there because you are already clipped to the iris. If you do a little bit mistake then uh, the intraocular lens may go down. I think this video is not playing. Okay. So talking about the iris laceration and iridodialysis. The iridodialysis represents the rupture of iris from its root. Um, mainly when we have to repair this iridodialysis whenever the patient is having a complaint like glare and monocular diplopia. So there is something called Jensen McKenna suture where you need to make a three limbal paracentesis then you have to pass the suture uh, pass through the lower rim of the steerer paracentesis into the PC through the iris root. The needle then leaves AC through the peripheral cornea. So just I am having uh, half a minute so I will try to finish as fast as possible. So three sutures pulled to the iris root to its original insertion. Then after putting that then you need to even suture the paracentesis also. This is the Jensen McKennell suture. You can see here a large uh, aridodialysis is there. You need to repair this. So already there is vitreous is there in the entry chamber also. Whenever there is vitreous, you need to do a proper vitrectomy. Make sure that there is no vitreous left behind in the entry chamber. So try to spend more time by doing a uh, vitrectomy so that uh, the whole vitreous will go back. Then you can start suturing. Half a minute, sir. Half a minute. As I said that three minimum incision you have to do. Once again depending upon how much is the area dialysis then you pass through that go through the iris then you can uh, take out the needle and suture. So if it is large I think you can make more than four five incision you try to take out the bite from the sclera through the iris then you can come out and you can suture to the steral wound. So talking about the complete aniridia, sometimes with a severe injury, I think even a patient may land with a complete aniridia. So there are a few things. If you are having a PC support, you can plan for a something called stained intraocular optical Mr. diaphragm. Sir, can you mm. yes, sir. conclude this? Yes, sir. And uh, if you are having a, don't have the capsular support, I think you can go for a uh, sclerofixated IL. These are the different type of diaphragm available in the market. So in the end summary, damage to the iris is a common manifestation of severe open and closed injuries. Only thing is you need to treat them properly so that the patient will not have any complaints. Thank you. Thank you and thank you Dr. Krishna Prasad for the comprehensive uh, management of uh, iris iridodialysis and then uh, sphincter, sphincter test. Uh, now I request Dr. Meena Chakravarti who is a well-known uh, vitreoretinal surgeon of uh, the country to speak on management of uh, vitreoretinal problems which are associated with the traumatic cataract. Over to you, madam. Good morning, everyone. And I would like to thank Satyamurti for having me in this course. I'll be dealing with the posterior segment complications associated with both blunt and penetrating injury. And I'd mainly like to cover two important, very pertinent posterior segment complications. One is a dislocated lens, and second is uh, vitreous hemorrhage. So when you're dealing with the patient who has a traumatized eye, uh, we usually make it a point to ask a few questions to the patient, especially questions which has relevance to the posterior part of the eye. What was the vision before trauma? Did the vision decrease immediately? Is it a progressive loss of vision? And in the present environment of uh, legal implications, was it an assault or a medical legal case? 
You have to look for collateral damage in the anterior segment of the eye, as well as evaluate the posterior segment in detail, look for associated injuries in the form of choroidal rupture, retinal hemorrhages or vitreous hemorrhage, occult scleral rupture, traumatic optic neuropathy, or retinal tear or retinal detachment. So this is a patient who had a blunt trauma and a, a dislocated IOL, dislocated crystalline lens at the beginning of the procedure and making the scleral flaps for uh, a scleral fixation in this patient. And during vitrectomy, you can see the dislocated lens in the vitreous cavity. In dealing with the dislocated uh, lens, perform as thorough a vitrectomy as possible, leave very little vitreous behind. A small amount of perfluorocarbon liquid has to be injected into the vitreous cavity to just bring up the dislocated lens into the mid-vitreous space so that you have adequate space to use a phacophragmatome and emulsify the lens. It will also see to it that the lens particles which shatter and come off the lens do not fall back on the macula and damage it. So the PFCL acts like a kind of cushion. The phacophragmentation fragmentation is being carried on. And you can see small particles which are scattered from the main uh, lens sticking to the edges of the perfluorocarbon liquid margin. These are usually part parts of the cortex and they can be cut with a cutter. You aspirate it, bring it to the midvitreous cavity and try to stuff it into the port of the cutting port of the cutter using the endo illuminator. I'm using a Gotex suture for the scleral fixation in this patient. This is a two-point scleral fixation and a scleral fixated IL is implanted. Now look at the second patient. He has a high myope who had sustained a blunt injury. His pupillary area was aphakic. The pupil is very small. It does not dilate beyond this. And preoperative B-scan ultrasonography showed that he had a retinal detachment also not a retinal detachment, a large flap could be seen and I suspected a giant retinal tear. The pupil is dilated with uh, iris hooks. You can see the Abel's vitreous base. And that's the edge of the dislocated uh, crystalline, cataractus crystalline lens. A lensectomy was performed, he was only about 30 years old, so I could, I could use the cutter to do a wet lensectomy. You can see the flap of the giant retinal tear. It's about a 180 degree GRT. And after a thorough vitrectomy and seeing to it that all the vitre vitreous base excision has been performed, Perfluorocarbon liquid will be injected into the vitreous cavity to flatten out the tear so that the tear sits smoothly on the buckle. About six rows of endolaser photocoagulation has to be performed. And the PFCL in the fill in the eye replaced with exchanged with silicon oil. The second important posterior segment complication that can occur in patients with blunt injury or a penetrating injury is a dense vitreous hemorrhage. You have to keep in mind that an occult scleral perforation can occur in these patients. And these are the various clinical features where you suspect an occult scleral perforation when the patient has a grossly hypotonous eye, an abnormally deep or an abnormally shallow anterior chamber. There is hemorrhagic chemosis, irregular pupil, and hyphema. A B-scan ultrasonography is of tremendous importance in, and has a critical role in uh, decision making. What is a little risky to do in a soft eye with a large scleral or a corneal tear. Supracoroidal hemorrhage also has to be suspected in these patients. The timing of vitrectomy is very rarely done early at the time of wound rupture. At, at the time of uh, primary su suturing of the wound, it is usually delayed by about two weeks, giving adequate time for a posterior vitreous separation to occur. There's a patient who has a large uh, scleral rupture and he also has a cataract. The scleral wound is closed first at the beginning of the procedure. A scleral buckle is also placed to 
support the retinal periphery. And later, about two weeks later, he's taken up for cataract surgery. The cataract surgery goes smoothly. He has a dense vitreous hemorrhage which has to be tackled. There's intraoperative meiosis at the completion of the cataract surgery. And you can see the density of the vitreous hemorrhage that this patient has. The vitreous hemorrhage is clear. The IOL implantation was done as a secondary procedure. Let us look at this patient who sustained a penetrating injury. He has a traumatic cataract, a corneoscleral wound. There's a corneal wound as well as a scleral wound. The scleral wound is repaired, followed by repair of the corneal tear. An ultrasonography later showed that he had a huge glass foreign body in the posterior segment and also vitreous hemorrhage. He's taken up of surgery a week later. The glass particle that is there in the posterior segment is very large. It cannot be removed to the sclerotomy. It is brought up into the pupillary space after injecting perfluorocarbon liquid and removed through the anterior route. The vitrectomy is completed and silicon oil fill is done. This is a 32-year-old patient who had a blunt injury and a total high femur. B-scan ultrasonography showed that he had a vitreous hemorrhage. The high femur is drained first. And cataract surgery is uh, performed. The cataract surgery goes smoothly. And the vitreous hemorrhage is cleared. So we have to manage these patients in a comprehensive fashion. These are the post-operating appearance of these patients. This is another case after cataract surgery when the vision did not improve. The patient was found to have a sub-internal limiting membrane bleed after inducing a posterior vitreous detachment. He's a young patient, so a PBD induction was difficult in this patient. The internal limiting membrane is peeled. And the sub ILM blood is aspirated. He has a good macula and he gained very good vision. Traumatic macular hole is another associated uh, condition. There's a large traumatic macular hole, which was diagnosed uh, preoperatively itself. A combined procedure was done in this patient. The internal limiting membrane peeling is carried on. And the macular hole closed by a macular plug technique. I use autologous blood for all my patients, so I'm layering it over with autologous blood. So in short, it's very important to keep in mind that you have to counsel the patient thoroughly on the visual prognosis, a very realistic expectation of the visual prognosis that the patient is likely to have in the postoperative period and in the presence of the following complications. You have to explain to the patient that even after a, a very heroic surgical procedure, his visual recovery is not going to be that good. Follow-up after blunt trauma or a penetrating injury is very, very important. You have to follow up the patient for years and also make the patient understand that the posterior segment complication can occur at any period of time in the postoperative period. At each visit, maintain all records of the patient, document all the findings, let the patient see what he has in his eyes and counsel regarding the long-term sequelae of, these of an injury. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Madam. Thank, thanks a lot for the excellent talk. Uh, now we have 10 minutes left with us. Are there any questions for any of the speakers? Uh, one question to you and uh, Dr. Bharti. Uh, see, in case there is no capsular support, scleral fixation is better or uh, iris clara, retro iris fixation of the iris lens is better? Is also okay? It depends upon what the surgeon is comfortable with. There's actually not much difference in the visual recovery. If a no, no, from the point of uh, 
management of any retinal uh, tears in the or uh, retinal, <coughs> retinal detachment with PVR and all these things. A scleral fixation is better because better. the pupillary dilatation after an iris fixation will be a little hampered. So we have to see the periphery and but even that is not a problem in the present era where we are using biome for all our surgeries. So we can okay. still see the periphery. Sir, one small, uh, what are my observation, whenever there is no capsular support, you need to do a good vitrectomy. But vitrectomy done by anterior segment surgeon and vitrectomy done by posterior segment surgeon, there is a lot of difference is there. And I think I, nowadays most of us, I think we are not that good in uh, going through pars plana. I think especially if you do a pars plana vitrectomy, the chances of uh, uh, post-operative retinal detachment will be much lesser compared to whatever you go do through anterior approach. So only the key is I think probably we may have to do a good vitrectomy, then only if you do a good vitrectomy, I think probably, as Madam said, that wh whether you put a po posterior iris clip or do a sclerotic fixated does not make difference. Most of us do a won't do the proper vitrectomy. In the end, the patient come to be, especially when you're doing sclerotic fixated, patient come up comes after six months with a retinal detachment. I think uh, probably we. No, that's what my question was that only. See, yes, after implanting the lens, if patient yes. comes back with retinal problem, so yes. which one is better? Keeping that in mind. Yeah, lenses when you consider the pupillary dilatation as the criteria for a retinal management and apart from that there are issues about phacodonosis with uh, iris claw lens and uh, incidence of cystoid macular edema which is uh, known to occur in uh, posterior retro pupillary enclavated lenses because of the iris irritation so uh, with that in picture I think scleral fixated lens score better for a Scleral fixated lenses per se has its own set of complications. Yeah, yeah. If the surgeon anchors the lens a little posteriorly, the chances of aggravating vitreoretinal traction is even higher. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it is very difficult to manage those situations when we cannot approach the periphery without uh, uh, tilting the lens. Once we indent the periphery, the lens gets tilted. So uh, and again, uh, what's your sur suggestion? Uh, Uterotin surgeon doing the uh, sleeve the fixation is better or the anti segment surgeon? The surgeon can ensure that he fixes the lens into the ciliary sulcus, then the scleral fixation would be ideal. As I said, anti vitrectomy, if it is not adequate, and then the, if you don't do a proper uh, vitreous base excision. Anterior base vitrectomy for an anterior segment surgeon who is, c who is conversant with the uh, pass plan approach would be yeah. ideal. But most anterior segment surgeons are not conversant with the pass plan approach. And secondly, in a hypotonus globe, it is very difficult to puncture the sclera for a self sealing incision. You can just use a 20, you can use a 20 gauge uh, MVR knife and puncture the sclera. That is easy. But if you have a valveless, val valveless sutureless stroker cannula incision, a hypotonus globe, it's quite difficult. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. So now, uh, question to Dr. Deepak Mego. S uh, would you like to do cataract uh, primary cataract resection at the primary stage itself, say a patient has got corneal tear and at uh, that uh, stage itself or you postpone it for the secondary? Yeah, uh, depends on the situation. Yeah. If the corneal tear is very small and tiny and it's not obscuring my visualization of the procedure. So in that situation, I would complete the surgery with the primary posterior capsule lens implantation. But many situations, the, the corneal tear is so big and it's going to hamper the visualization. In such situations, always a deferred uh, IOL implantation is going to be the criteria. Close the wound and remove the ruptured lens capsule and then leave him a fake kick. Let the eye settle down and then plan a secondary implant later after removing the corneal sutures. Let the corneal surface settle, the corneal irregularity settle, and then we can calculate the power a little bit better and then do. If it's a small tear, usually it's that very common, uh, maybe just request two or three sutures in the peripheral, I would still go ahead and do a um, primary uh, procedure uh, involving in putting the lens inside. Dr. KP, you want to add something to this? Okay, so the, I mean the indications are uh, this, if patient you are suspecting uh, say endophthalmitis, you want to see retina properly, probably that is one stage we have to, and then if a fluffy cortex which is floating in the antechamber, and then maybe causing a lot of inflammation, or a lens if it is becoming uh, swollen, uh, uh, resulting in pupillary block and then uh, secondary glaucoma, probably it's, uh, otherwise secondary stage procedure is always better, second stage procedure is always better. Yeah, in, uh, in the question was, you know, how to deal with the raised pressure, you know, obviously majority of times it's an emergency situation where we have to remove the lens because the lens matter itself is causing the secondary glaucoma. Yeah. 
so in le- ruptured lens uh, matter and sometimes mm-hmm. anterior su- lens surplus fusion causing pupillary block and secondary glaucoma in all these situations i think surgical intervention is going to sort out your uh, glaucoma related issues primarily now uh, continuing the discussion on glaucoma uh, so all these traumatic glaucoma say where there is angle decision then patient has a traumatic attack uh, is uh, i don't know i didn't uh, listen to your uh, this thing was not there at the time the conservative management does it have a role here or uh yeah, angle decision glaucoma is very uh, difficult to they very refractory to treatment medical line of treatment invariably surgical intervention is required so in uh, uh, usually my strategy is a patient having an angle decision glaucoma with a traumatic cataract combined with a primary filtering procedure with mitomycin c uh and uh, because they are very unlikely that we are going they're going to respond to uh, your medical line of therapy if the angle decision is more than 180 degrees so gonioscopy is the key here and once you do that uh, uh invariably uh, they say the pressures are so high that we need to combine in the primary setting itself most of them in they in fact end up having tube surgery so you need to do tube surgery and then as far as the eye wall implantation is concerned which is uh, better i mean what type of lens is used and then whether it should be again at the primary stage or uh, as a second stage procedure uh, ap no i i will i will implantation i would uh, go with always in the primary stage only sir uh, any surgery if you think that if you t- unless and until some of the especially there is a gross uh, a uh, corneal tear repair and in such cases just you take out the cataract then you say come with the proper biometry as you said in your this thing but the most of the thing i think in the primary step only if you go the eye implantation is better whether you uh, put the scissor fixated or uh, of course nowadays most of us uh, we go with the clip lenses so i think primary step only my preferred choice so yes yeah. dr deepak what regarding no whether you want to implant lens in the primary stage uh, removal of uh, primary stage itself uh, when you remove the cataract or yeah, you know. wait and then as a secondary yeah, yeah. i will implant i, 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 like I answered this question before uh, the uh, two or three issues are uh, will determine whether this thing uh, you are suspecting a major uh, uh, coexisting vitreoretinal pathology like infection or presence of a uh, retinal attachment all these situations would i would defer the primary lens implantation Uh, even a retained a suspected retained intraocular foreign body you know we're expecting a lot of inflammation you always defer it uh, surgically also sometimes the visibility is very poor because of the bad corneal injury and all these things so you're not able to see delineate the anatomy very well again you need to uh, defer it uh, that's the thing otherwise as i said small tears and all you can always go ahead and put a primary setting mm-hmm. as dr kp was saying so and uh, what is your experience in anaridia total anaridia which uh, has i mean have in our hospital two cases we have done actually total anaridia uh, actually that is a congenital anaridia actually we did and uh, patients is doing really well uh, once again the oh, there was no support was there there is uh, no capsular support was there so we did a good vitrectomy then with a scissor fixated eye wall so only thing is we need to order much before to the company so little bit uh, i will come back to the same situation we had i mean the same question we had in uh, state conference a patient 55 year old man with a <laughs> formed nucleus and a small uh, corneal tear or may may medium size corneal tear would you like to remove it through the tear or the no i think i would prefer always a primary separate incision close yeah. the tear first make a separate incision as spiral tunnel or whatever the way of your cataract extraction and then do because i wouldn't want to uh, meddle with the 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 corneal tear close it primarily then make a separate incision and remove and then it is uh, usually that's my strategy yeah, correct because endothelial damage will be much less if you do a separate incision and uh, you can have a nice formed chamber and then along with that we can uh, uh, any other questions and then uh, if we uh, how long would you like to wait for the corneal to settle down if you've done a corneal tear repair after for eye wall implantation or uh, at least n- six months at least three to six months uh, because i want a, s- a stigmatism to settle down uh, because the other part will settle down inflammation everything will be settled down in one six weeks itself but for it to heal and the estimates are maybe three to six months and then i will plan it later remove the sutures and again reassess it and then post the patient for surgery okay sir thank you so are there any questions from the audience so with this we'll come to end of this session
I'd like to thank all the delegates and uh, all uh, my uh, speakers in my session. Thank you very much. <laughs>